The word workaholic usually has some pretty negative connotations. It brings to mind images of people working unhealthily long hours, all the while completely ignoring family and friends. Just look at all these negative stock images that came up when I typed workaholic into Google Images. However, there's nothing inherently wrong with putting a lot of time into what you love, so long as you manage to do so in a healthy manner. Aaron Turner is an example of a man who has managed to do that. He's best known for his role in the band Isis, although their discography represents only a fraction of what he's done. Discussing everything he's ever recorded in the musical world would be impossible to do in a video with reasonable length, but today I'll try to do my best to cover what I think are his most noteworthy achievements. Aaron Bradford Turner was born on November 5th, 1977 in Springfield, Massachusetts. His mother was a teacher and his father was an author. They apparently had a good deal of artist friends whom he later described as creatively nurturing. When he was young, his family moved to New Mexico. Whether or not he ever had Walter White as a teacher has never been confirmed by either party. For most children, a move like this would be extremely difficult to adjust to. However, it eventually proved beneficial for Turner. In a later interview with Boston Phoenix, he said that part of why he got into music as much as he did was due to the lack of youth culture in Mexico, which left him yearning for something to do. In that same interview, when asked about his own musical tastes, he said, My earliest influences were pretty much rock and metal. Classic shit like Zeppelin and Hendrix. I'm a guitar player, so naturally that was the stuff I was drawn to when I was young. And metal was a huge part of my teenage years. Megadeth, Metallica, Slayer, all that shit. These influences would continue into his adult life, as most of his projects, as experimental as they are, are very rooted in heavy metal music. At 17, he formed a small company that sold mail-order punk records. This venture would provide valuable experiences, as when he later moved to Boston to attend the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, he founded Hydra Head Records. Hydra Head was born out of Turner's original distribution company. Boston local band Vent gave him a 7-inch single of theirs to release in 1995, which would be the first recording to be released on the label. By 1999, records sold by Hydra Head were regularly selling between 3,000 and 5,000 records, all the more impressive considering that Turner was still the only employee. Eventually, Hydra Head was able to sign artists from all over the country. The genre range of said artists was wide, including genres such as grindcore, mathcore, black metal, and even experimental hip-hop. In 2012, Turner announced that the label would undergo the process of seizing releases by new artists, although they would continue to maintain their back although they would continue to maintain their back catalog. He cited a decline in finances as the main reason. In 2017, they came back to release The Thin Black Duke by Oxbow, an album that had been scheduled to come out on Hydra Head and had been unable to find another label. Turner expressed interest in releasing more records on a case-by-case -case basis. In 2019, they released Final Transmission by Caven, a band that Turner had close ties to. More on that later. In 2020, the label officially shut down and the rights to all the albums were sold back to their artists. While it might not still exist, for a record label founded by a guy in his college dorm, Hydra Head certainly did alright. Turner still does partake in the label side of things, running Sige Records. I apologize for having not yet covered any music he actually wrote. I figured this video would work best if I split it into sections, and it only felt natural to do Hydra Head first to knock it out of the way. Now, let's cover his first big band, and arguably the thing he's best known for, Isis. In the autumn of 1997, Turner became roommates with one Jeff Caxide. The two of them were both musicians and had similar music tastes, so it was only a matter of time before the two of them began playing music together. Eventually, motivated by a dissatisfaction with their previous projects, they put together a band they named after the Egyptian goddess Isis. After some early lineup changes, they settled on a lineup of Turner on guitar and vocals, Caxide on bass, Michael Gallagher on second guitar, Bryant Clifford Meyer on keyboards, and Aaron number two, Aaron Harris on drums. Isis played a style of metal called post-metal. I already made a video on post-rock, so those of you who have seen that will know what 
post can mean in a musical context. In short, post metal is a genre that combines heavy riffs with repetitive structures and an emphasis on atmospheric introspection. Isis's debut album, 2000's Celestial, laid the groundwork for this sound, although it was still heavily rooted in sludge metal, a genre that, well, sounds like its name sludge metal. The 2002 follow-up, Oceanic, had them stretch their wings a little more, featuring a higher amount of clean riffs and soft dynamics. It was their third album, 2004's Panopticon, where they truly found the perfect mix. I'm not going to get too much into this, since honestly, I kind of want to do a video about this album in the future, but uh, long story short, this is one of the best albums I've ever listened to. The crushing distorted guitar riffs and clean interludes complement each other perfectly, and while the songs are lengthy, they don't drag. I first listened to this album while on a cross-country flight, and it was a religious experience. Isis would go on to release two more albums, In the Absence of Truth and Wavering Radiant, before disbanding in 2010. In a blog post, they said that their breakup was due to them having done everything they wanted to do. In 2018, they would reunite for a one-off show under the name Celestial at a memorial concert for their close friend Caleb Schofield. Personally, part of me hopes they never do a full reunion. So that was Isis. Now, it's time to talk about some of Turner's other bands. Bit of a disclaimer, I'm not nearly as familiar with the other bands as I am with Isis, so apologies if some of what I say about them is a little surface level. In 1999, Turner teamed up with the aforementioned Caleb Schofield of Caven, Nate Newton of Converge, and Santos Montano. Together, they formed the band Old Man Gloom. They played music similar to Isis, albeit with a greater emphasis on heaviness and sludge metal riffs. Over the next five years, they put out four albums, Meditations in B, Seminar 2 and 3, and Christmas. After that last one out, the group entered, uh, after that last one was put out, the group entered an extended hiatus. Members insisted that the band was not broken up, but that they were just too busy with their other projects to make music together, as Isis, Caven, and Converge were all finding big success. In 2012, they finally found a time to regroup and release their comeback album, No. It was 2014, however, when they did their most ambitious project. In August of that year, they had announced that their next album would be called The Ape of God and would be released in November. The weekend before the release date, however, they revealed that it would actually be a double album, consisting of almost 90 minutes of music. This was made even more shocking by the fact that the version of the record they had sent out to critics was actually a collection of remixed songs from both albums, amounting to only about 45 minutes. The prank was, as Wikipedia says, very negatively received. Turner said in an interview that this was done as a way to get back at music journalists, and honestly, I can't say I blame him. We suck. The record itself is very worth listening to, both sides if you can make the time. If you want to just listen to one of them, well, I think the first side is a little better than the second, but that that's just my opinion. And again, listen to both sides of it. In 2018, the project faced great tragedy when bassist slash vocalist Caleb Schofield passed away in a car accident. After a period of much needed mourning, seriously, rest in peace, Secret C. The band was joined by Schofield's bandmate, Stephen Brodsky, to fill the gap. In 2020, they would release Seminar 8 and Seminar 9, and they are still active to this day. Now let's talk about Turner's most well-known band formed after Isis's breakup. In 2014, Turner decided he wanted to make, in his own words, some of the heaviest music he had ever created. He recruited Nick Yakshin of Vancouver-based hardcore band Baptists on drums. For bass, he hit up the one and only Brian Cook of Russian Circles and formerly of Botch and These Arms Are Snakes. Together, they formed Sumac. The presence of three well-established musicians in the band caused Wikipedia to refer to them as a supergroup. Due to Cook's commitments with Russian circles, Sumac can't really be a full-time touring band per se. Turner apparently doesn't mind this, saying that he is in no rush to start touring six months out of the year again. Honestly, fair. It was only a year before they put out their debut album, The Deal. Personally, I would suggest checking out their sophomore effort, What One Becomes. It was the first one I listened to, and 
What can I say? I just like it. You know it's unique when Spotify has to split the songs into multiple parts. I would also recommend listening to 2018's Love in Shadow. These are both journeys to get to, but they're rewarding. Zumak has also collaborated multiple times with Japanese noise artist Kaiji Haino. They've put out the albums American Dollar Bill, Keep Facing Sideways, You're Too Hideous to Look At, Face On, even for just the briefest moment, Keep Charging This Explanation plug-in to Making It Slightly Better, and Into This Juvenile Apocalypse, Our Golden Blood to Pour Let Us Never. I haven't checked out any of them since... Honestly, I'm a little scared too. Now, it's time for a quick intermission. I've spent a whole video talking about Turner's contribution to making art you can hear. Well, he's also good at making art you can see and feel. He got into visual art at a very early age, taking up drawing as a hobby. He said in an interview, I was pretty avid in my practice of drawing and painting from an early age. I remember being able to occupy myself for long stretches of time by doing that. Apparently, whenever he drew in class, he was able to listen clearly to the teachers as well. As a result, when they called on him to try and catch him not paying attention, he was prepared. Man, where do I learn such a skill? He began doing album artwork for his own bands upon realizing that no one else would be able to understand the band's artistic vision as well as, well, the musicians themselves. As he puts it, I also generally reject the idea that posters and album sleeves and t-shirts have to be marketing tools with overly obvious type graphics, as opposed to more artistically oriented pieces that invoke the true spirit of the music they are intended to represent. Yeah, that's true. Album covers he's, he's done that I particularly like include Harmonic Tremors by Zozobra, Petitioning the Empty Sky by Converge, and Meanderthal by Torsha. He himself has says that he personally considers the aforementioned What Be What One Becomes by Sumac and a 2013 reissue of Celestial by Isis to be some of his best work. All right, now let's get back to music. I said earlier that workaholics are stereotyped as not wanting to spend much time with their families. One solution to that is to do what Turner did and bring your family into your workplace. Allow me to introduce to you one Faith Colosia, Aaron Turner's wife. She already had a background in music, playing in the band Ever Lovely Lightning Hearts. When their paths first crossed, she invited him to collaborate on a new project of hers called Mammifer. Eventually, he became a permanent member, which also coincided with the two of them starting to date. Their debut album, Hearer Ennifer, was released in 2008. Mammifer is an interesting addition to Turner's discography. Colosia definitely does bring some interesting musical influences to the table, as the music she and Turner make isn't metal in the slightest, going for a more ambient rock sound. I, I gotta say, I kinda dig it. It's very calming, which music has to be sometimes. I would suggest checking out 2016's The World Unseen. The two of them enjoy working on their endeavors so much that, as of 2018, they apparently have never taken a vacation together. Hey, if you love doing what you do, nothing wrong with that. So there you have it. Aaron Turner is a guy who found out what he wanted to do at a very early age, and just kept on doing it. While never breaking into the musical mainstream, he's been able to become one of the more prolific figures in the underground. If I were to go in-depth in every album he's ever put out with his bands, this video would be like three hours long, but hopefully I've covered the big releases sufficiently. Now that I've done a fair deal of talking, I want you to do a fair deal of listening. Pick a band I've mentioned that you haven't checked out, and go listen to some of their music. Even if you don't end up liking it, as long as you stepped outside of your comfort zone, that's what's important. If you're still watching by now, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me your time. Uh, if you like what you saw, be sure to like and hit subscribe. I upload videos whenever I can. I always have a ton of fun making them. Hopefully you have as much fun watching them. Uh, if you have an idea for a video you want me to do, leave it in the comments. Who knows? Maybe I'll get to it. I'm RobbieJ2734. I will see you when I see you next.